Hello, my name is Nick Hopwood. I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, welcome to this short video on working with data in theory, a practical guide. I'm just going to run through a few key ideas that I hope might be helpful. This is something that many people, myself included, found and find um, really tricky and often non-intuitive. And so what I'm hoping to do is to present some ideas that are not specific to any one theory or any one kind of data. Um, they're not linked to any particular methodology or framework. So in that sense, they're relatively simple, but I think they capture something of the kind of the, the kernel or the core of what it means to uh, work with data and theory. And one of the things that I would say before I start is, um, for a while I shared with many people, I wouldn't say a distrust, but a scepticism around research which uses theory and you know it might be for example in a theory i work with you might say oh i'm going to use practice theory or activity theory and let's imagine that practice theory involves looking at the world through red goggles here are my red goggles and it seems sometimes that what people do is go oh my gosh everything is red look at that and I've read papers like that, uh, you know, as a reviewer and as an editor. And you think, yes, but you're always going to see the world as red because you put red goggles on or green goggles. And um, so what we can't do as researchers is really say, well, the theory, you know, that somebody invented in an armchair somewhere or in some of the things says this. And I kind of, yeah, I can, I find it the way exactly the theory told me to go. And I know there are some versions of research which accept, you know, kind of empirical testing out of theory. I'm not discounting that. Um, but often in social science, that's really not kind of what we're into. So I'm going to suggest that this unfolds through three steps. And the first one involves matching concepts with examples. Uh, you know, from the data, some real event or you know, something that somebody said or something that happened. And I think of this as a formative first step. And when I say formative, I mean that by looking for examples of a particular concept, for example, from a theory, it might help you see things in the data that you didn't see before. Pay more attention to something somebody said or something you observed or you know, heard or noticed in an image or whatever it might be. It also should help refine your understanding of the concepts. It's one thing to read you know, a, a, you know, a book on theory, whether that's Bourdieu, or Foucault, Wolchatsky, or um, you know, who else, you know, many people it might be, um, Gonzalez Ray, like, huge numbers of people or theories. It's one thing to read it in the book and go, oh yeah, okay, I think I understand that concept now. Um, or you know, I can even write about it. It's another thing to see it in some data. And I think that matching process should be a struggle. And if it's not a struggle, then maybe you're not doing it right. Maybe you're not really pushing the edges or challenging yourself and thinking, OK, have I really got this concept right? And you should, you know, it should be the struggle around the edges. And would that really be an example of X or would it be an example of Y or is it both? All that kind of thing. So I think this should be kind of intellectually hard work. To be rigorous, it should be hard. And it's also formative in the sense that by matching concepts with examples, you can then go on and do other things. This is by no means the end of the journey. It's a really important, necessary start. So what you have done by matching examples is relabeling X, something in everyday language, like, you know, oh, a child did this or played in some way, as Y, something in theoretical language. <sighs> Bless me. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. So you've relabeled something. So you might say by saying this theory has a concept of uh, I don't know what it might be. Um, mediation is a concept from activity theory or um, there might be microaggressions, for example, in you know, some, some understandings of organizations or um, mimesis and you know, all sorts of concepts like that. You might say, aha, when they did that, that was a microaggression. OK, so they've changed their utterance, something somebody said to each other, to an example of, say, a microaggression. Or using critical race theory, you might say, ah, that statement there was racist. So you might have relabeled something from its everyday form, like a question. You might say that started life as a question, but now I put my theoretical goggles on, I'm saying that is a racist question or something like that. So you've changed something from X, its original, to Y. 
an expression of it in theoretical language. Now, having done that, you've done a whole load of important things because by doing that, something that you might have missed completely in its everyday form becomes visible and noticeable in its theoretical expression. Something that you might have noticed but thought, yeah, boring, mundane, trivial, becomes significant because you're seeing it through these theoretical eyes. Something that seemed isolated and on its own and disconnected becomes connected because in fact it's one, of, like, you know, kind of it's part of a chain of, the, of a theoretical chain. It isn't obvious in the kind of the, or concrete manifestation. Something that I, so looks the same as something else apparently becomes very different. For example, you know, research on the way that teachers use questioning in classes. Now, a theory might tell you that questions, you know, different kinds of questions are really, you know, kind of questions vary in this way. And so you might look at something and go, oh yeah, they're all questions. And now you go, no, but they're not all the same kind of question. And the theory helps you see difference where you might otherwise have treated things to be the same. Or the opposite. Things that um, seem more different might actually be theoretically the same or you know, kind of very similar. So by relabeling X, the concrete, the everyday, the immediate, the obvious, through a theoretical language into variations of Y, you make all these new things possible, new noticings, new significance, new connection, new similarity, or new difference, for example. Now, once you've done that, you can do important things. You can see patterns that you couldn't see before, Patterns that exist between those understandings of the phenomenon through why, you know, through the theory. So you might be saying, what are you seeing repeatedly, for example, particularly in different contexts or in different forms? And that might reply on seeing things as the same when in everyday, you know, through everyday eyes, you might have seen them as differently. You might see things as occurring together in sequence or in consequence for one another through having labelled them and understood them in a particular theoretical way. Things might not fit in now that you're understanding them in theoretical terms, whereas looking at them the everyday, they might not have looked so unusual or kind of ill-fitting. So you can look for patterns that are patterns that can only be seen through the theoretical eyes which you're looking with. And then you can finally put the theory to work. And everything you've done so far, it's nice and it's important, but I would say often in the papers I read kind of, you know, and sometimes while I try and write, of low value add, unless we come to this final stage, which is use all of those insights, the relabeling of X into Y, the distinctions, the, uh, the similarities, the difference in significance through theory, theory Y, then seeing the patterns that you can now see that you understand and notice the things that theory Y tells you to understand and notice. Once you've done all of those, now you can finally do add on to Z. You might be able to use those patterns that you see through theory Y to say how something works and why it works in that particular way. How something is accomplished, the expertise, the aesthetics, performance and connection involved. Maybe something amazing has happened and people want to understand how did they get to do that? You know, maybe they managed to achieve something in some conditions that people in similar looking conditions have not been able to do and you're like wow okay then the theory is starting to you know bite and give me something useful. You know, people say there's nothing so practical as a good theory, quite if you can do this sort of thing with it. You might be able to say why something happens. And that's a theoretical version of kind of causal explanation, not an experimental kind of cause and effect. But for example, like why when so many people, you know, kind of accept that racism is not OK and would regard themselves as not racist, racism is still being reproduced, for example. Theory can give you that kind of why explanation. Theories can also tell you why you might value something more or less than something that otherwise looks quite similar, where there's something might be better, more just, more impactful than something else. There's a great article by Stig Brustrom on children's play, which firstly says we look through this Vygotskyan theory and then we have to show that here we're seeing a scaffolding or here we're seeing a zone of proximal development, that's the X equals Y stuff. And then they notice patterns and then they say, well, actually, if you look, you see, you know, these kinds of plays seem to be similar in this respect and different from these, and we associate them with this zone of proximal development or significance. So when you see ZPD, you see significance, and then we start to see patterns in terms of, oh, there are things that teachers do here that seem to be associated with this kind of play. And then they conclude by saying, aha, 
So it's this special kind of play that we can only distinguish from other kinds of play through our theoretical lens that we actually think is better for children's learning. Boom! There you go. That's the theory being put to work. So matching concepts should be difficult and it should be formative. Should help you with understanding the data, understanding the concepts and be really troubling and difficult when you do that. And then enable you to do other things. Those other things. Seeing similarity, difference, importance, significance and distinction where you might not otherwise see it, for example. Then you can look for those patterns, co-occurrence, um, juxtaposition, consequence, sequence, all those kind of things. Then all through theory, why, whatever it is you're using. And then you can start to say important things about the world through theory. So that's my little quick guide to, to using theory. As you'll see, it's very generic. I made reference to a couple of theories. Um, I hope you find it useful. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please feel free to add some comments. If you're going to meet me in class, then um, I hope look forward to having a chat and further discussion with you about that then. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.